Welcome back to part two of our exploration of the Mycenaeans. Since in the previous lecture we examined the rise of the early Mycenaean elite clusters in various parts of the mainland, as well as their efforts towards aggrandizement and legitimization, in today's lecture we're going to follow them to the end of their run and the collapse of their respective palatial polities. So let's turn to our trusty chronological chart to which you should be used to by now. So, so far we have covered the EBA for all three geographical denominations, as well as the period of the middle and the early part of the late Bronze Age, again for all three denominations, but in two parts, first for Crete, right, and then for the mainland, the Cyclades. So in today's lecture, we're going to go all the way from um, 1450, more or less, BCE, down to 1200 BCE. So in this episode, we will discuss the transition into statehood for the various Mycenaean state polities, because in this period there is material evidence for the consolidation of these polities, with the creation and embellishment of the physical center of the polity, and of course the construction of the Mycenaean Acropolis and the palace, but also in a more abstract sense with the setting up of the palatial administration. So where were these Mycenaean polities that I keep referring to? Our clues here for our portioning the landscape is the presence of a Mycenaean Acropolis, which becomes the center of the notional state. So in cases like Messenia, Laconia, Athens, Orchomenos, and Thebes, as well as Iolkos or Dimini. The task is pretty straightforward since the citadels are spaced far enough apart that drawing their hypothetical boundaries is not very difficult. Or in rare cases, like this one of Messenia, then Linear B Palace Archive prefers to place names that once studied and plotted on a map, as was done by John Bennett, they give us the emic approach to Mycenaean geography. So, for instance, in the archives from the Palace of Pylos that I have marked on the slide with the, the, uh, the orange star, there is reference of a physical barrier, right? The Egalian mountain range which separated the kingdom into two provinces, this side of the Egalian and the other side of the Egalian. But things are not always as clear as this. So for instance, in the area of the Argolid, things are a little more complex. And they are more complex because there are at least four Acropolis verified by archeological exploration those at Mycenae, Tyrins, Argos, and Midea. All these citadels in this small space, which by the way is one of the few fertile plains in Greece, are certainly a head scratcher. But since we have been tossing this term around, what is a Mycenaean Acropolis? A Mycenaean Acropolis is a fortified hill, is a citadel and is also a center of the Mycenaean city itself. The fortification wall afforded the people inside of it protection, but also made a pretty powerful statement. At the top of the hill, you would find the palace of the Mycenaean ruler, which in Homer is described as the Megaron. This slide shows you a 3D reconstruction of Mycenae. Before we go and examine the palace itself, let's look at Mycenae primarily as an example of a Mycenaean Acropolis. Because as you're going to see, the, uh, the uh, palace itself is not, is not preserved very well. Mycenae, as we mentioned already, is in the Argolid. There, a powerful elite family had already marked their presence by investing in the mortuary landscape, first with the grave circles and later on with a litany of tholos The Mycenaean Acropolis 
and especially this one at Mycenae, have been studied exhaustively, and we know that they went through various phases. The first phase of construction in most of the citadels dates to late Helladic 3a, or around 1400 BCE. So in late Helladic 3a, Mycenae gets its first fortification wall, which I've been indicated on the slide with a gray outline. So this first phase left the grave circle A outside the perimeter of the wall. Moreover, the access to the Acropolis was done from the south following a path that took you in between the grave circle and the wall, as I'm indicating on the slide. The wall itself was built with large irregular stones that were laid together without mortar, like you see on the picture I put up on the slide. And this is a type of masonry that, when seen from later Greeks, led them to think that these walls were built by the Cyclops, these mythical um, giant creatures with one eye in the middle of the forehead. Therefore, nowadays, this type of masonry is called Cyclopean. A short hundred years after the Acropolis was built, it was enlarged to include a lower lying area in the southwest part of the hill and of course the grave circle A. During this time, the grave circle was also revamped. The level of the cemetery was raised. A massive terrace wall was built to keep all this dirt from raising the level. And of course the stelae were reset to create a new cemetery, which was now incorporated into the Acropolis. This was a powerful statement on behalf of the ruling elite of the citadel. It's like they were saying to you, here are my ancestors, and the ancestors were the first ones to see after one entered the Acropolis. And since I mentioned entering, the entrance to the Acropolis was also revamped and changed drastically. So the access was changed, as I said, and uh, now access was from the north. Traffic was piped through a monumental gateway framed with a bastion, as you can see here on the, the plan. And the bastion was on the right-hand side of your approach as you were ascending, since this was your most vulnerable while holding a shield and attacking, of course, the, the Acropolis. The gate was not just a functional part of the wall, but again, a material statement of power. Take, for instance, the massive monolithic doorposts or the monolithic threshold, or the lentil, or the massive boulders, each of which weighs three tons or 6,000 pounds. The logistics of this construction alone are awe-inspiring. The, the symbols used in the relieving triangle over the gate are also awe-inspiring and are illustrative again, of the cultural entanglement that was going on in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. The space of the relieving triangle, which is a device of megalithic architecture uh, used to relieve the weight of the masonry, was not left blank, but was taken up by a relief. The relief shows two her heraldic felines with their front feet resting on a Minoan type altar, actually two of them. The altars also support an equally Minoan style column. But this gate does not just tip the hat to the Minoans, but also to the neighboring Hittites. In the capital Hattusha, the main gate is also embellished with lions, and the connections do not end there. Recently, Nick Blackwell has shown that the stone carving technique used at the Lion Gate of Mycenae is akin to Hittite stone carving techniques, which might mean that Hittite stonemasons 
worked on this gate, or they had trained the stonemasons that did. Right around 1250 BCE, another extension of the Acropolis happened, which included a small but pretty crucial part of the hill that the citadel was sitting on. That is, the northeast end of the Acropolis was incorporated, and it was incorporated because it had access to a cistern and a spring. Clearly, Access to water during times of siege was a concern, hence the building of a shaft with a staircase that provided safe access to water was created here. Similar concerns for shoring up the fortifications and securing access to water were not just present at Mycenae but also in neighboring Tyrins where we see similar projects taking place 70 or 50 years before the final destructions that affect the citadels. But since we mentioned Tyrants, let's say a few things about this interesting Acropolis. So here's Mycenae, and here's the position of Tyrants. Tyrants might have been one with a harbor, and even though Tyrants, uh, as you can see here on the map, is not on the coast today, it is certain that in antiquity the coastline was much, much closer to the citadel. Terence is a great place to study Mycenaean fortifications and all the contraptions that the Mycenaean engineers worked into the design of these ensembles. Terence, with its much better preservation compared to Mycenae, that is, shows us also that the Acropolis was sectioned off into two parts. The higher part, reserved for the Megaron, i.e. the palace, and the lower part, for less important houses, which were by no means lowly, right? The Megaron, as we said before, was the central place of the citadel. All the access roads and streets led you clearly from the gateway of the Acropolis to the palace. So let's turn our gaze to it. And to describe the palace and what the palace was, Let's use the plan from the Palace of Nestor, situated here. We're going to use it as a template. And if we take our cues for uh, the Mycenaean Palace from the Palace of Pylos, the palaces were two-story buildings with elaborate decoration and many modern amenities like baths, night wells, and a sewage system. The heart of the palace was the Megaron. The Megaron is a distinctive architectural form which typically consists of a large hall with a central hearth, one or more ante rooms, and a front porch. The Megaron was a great feasting hall and a throne room, since, much like the throne room at Knossos, the Megaron in Pylos preserved a throne and identical wall paintings on the wall. Here's what the Megaron of Pylos would have looked like back in the day. The throne was in front of a large decorated hearth and backed by a wall decorated with griffins and lions standing guard and framing the enthroned person, again a powerful statement of power. During ritual and ceremonial occasions, the feasting hall would be full of important people. By the way, the less important people We'd be dining outside. The ceremonies in the main feasting hall, of course, necessitated a bunch of resources. Resources that were stored very close to the Megaron itself, in the rooms around the perimeter. The rooms behind the Megaron were pantries and storerooms, filled with staples for the feast, such as oil, wine, wine cups, as you see in the photo from the storeroom of the museum. And note that this is but a small fraction of the wine cups recovered during excavation. Much like the Manoan palaces, there were workshops that were included in the palace and can be found at the northeast building over here. The building 
housed industrial activities and also functioned as the armory, as I say on the slide, since 500 bronze arrowheads were found in the southernmost room of the building. The whole operation seems to have been tightly controlled. The center of operations was a small room, two actually, one next to the other, which were next to the entrance of the palace. There in these two small rooms, the entire palace archive was kept for the last year of the palace where it was discovered. And here's what the archive would have looked like. Tablets of unbaked clay would have been categorized and stored in baskets on shelves after the scribe would have recorded on them important information about the holdings of the palace or commodities coming in or out. We will return to this archive and poke around for more information in just a little bit. Finally, the palace was the residence of the ruling family. The residential area has been located on the southeast corner of the palace, but surely extended upstairs on the second story, since there is evidence of a staircase leading upstairs. We don't know a lot about what was going on upstairs, but archaeological evidence from the ground floor indicates the existence of a living room, so to speak, and other amenities. So let's visit the residential quarters. You would have entered the residential quarters through the open-air courtyard between the Megaron and the entrance to the palace. Here's what the courtyard would have looked like. The living room, as I call it, was a smaller hearth room connected to another enclosed courtyard marked by 47 on the plan. Other amenities close to the Queen's Megaron, or the living room as I called it, was a room with a bathtub, with no drain though. Whether you are on Crete or on the mainland, the palaces seem to have served the same, very similar set of functions and purposes. And this is something to be expected, because when the Mycenaeans were ready for palaces, i.e. central administrative buildings with amenities for social gatherings, the Mycenaeans, of course, did not reinvent the wheel and took their cues from the Minoans. Actually, here on Opilos, Mike Nelson suggested that the first iteration of the palace was more Minoan-like than we perceive we can perceive nowadays, with a central court and all, a feature that was dropped in later rebuildings. But the palaces were not completely the same. Think about the differences as you are preparing for your next quiz. Before we leave the topic of the palace, let's talk about the elephant in the room. I have been referring to the Linear B and the administration of it all many times. So what is the Linear B? Linear B is a syllabic script for writing Mycenaean Greek and predates the Greek alphabet by many centuries, while having absolutely no relation to it, other than the fact that they're both used to write the same language. The script can be found on vases, as well as documents like tablets, which were used for accounting purposes in the palaces. It has been found in a number of citadels, driving home the conclusion that this was not a script that everybody used, but a technology closely associated with the palatial administration. Therefore, when the palaces get destroyed and disappear at the end of the late Helladic 3B or the, you know, the equivalent of a 1200 BCE, so does the Near B. The decipherment of the script by Michael Ventris, a British cryptographer who after the war devoted himself to the decipherment of the code and cracked it, opened up a window into inaccessible aspects of Mycenaean culture, even though the tablets do not preserve literature at all, but accounts galore. 
Here are some of the types of information that we get from Linear B documents. That is, if our reconstructions are correct. So, the texts describe various levels of the social hierarchy, according to titles that describe the place of the person in the hierarchy and their function. So, we're not going to go through the entire hierarchy, but we're going to single out two positions. The first one is the Wanax, as it's so called the Linear B. He sits on the top of the pyramid and has been interpreted as the king, a title that in later Greek is reserved only for the king of the gods, Zeus. The other title I would like to draw your attention to is Quasireu, which amounts to the later Greek word Basileus. In later Greek, it is this word too is interpreted as a king. This time it refers to human kings. In the Linear B text, the Quasireu is a lower king that gets sort of elevated after the collapse of the palaces. Interesting, isn't that so? Other interesting aspects of the social hierarchy is the documented existence of slaves, and actually a few different categories of them, including the existence of groups of women weavers. That were, that were from other parts of the Aegean, like Miletus and Knidos, on the western coast of modern-day Turkey. Another topic that Linear B touches upon, only to tease us, is religion. And I say tease us because the documents mention the preparations for a religious festival by giving us lists of things and commodities that went towards it and several names of gods. And lo and behold, the names of later Greek gods are mentioned in here, but no more details, leaving us guessing. Well, we can make up a lot with research, but it would have been nice if they had left a sticky note, right? With a couple more details, don't you think? Another aspect of Mycenaean palatial reach and power that we should not forget to mention is Mycenaean engineering. The southern Greek mainland is littered with examples of Mycenaean engineering like bridges, roads, but also much bigger projects like the drainage project of the Lake Copaes in Boeotia that I'm showing you here on the slide, which is an amazing project in itself. Or another one that we're not going to discuss here, a possible artificial harbor in Pylos. Let me know if you want to read about it. I'm telling you, these engineers were pretty amazing. Note that here, right, in Lake Copais, in Boeotia, after the Mycenaean works fell into disrepair and the lake filled up again, it was drained only in the 19th century, and that was not for lack of trying. By the way, the lake that I'm talking about was a shallow, marshy lake, the level of which fluctuated based on the seasons. So the Mycenaeans built a system of dikes and levees and diverted the rivers and drained water into natural sinkholes and all of that to free up all this agricultural land in the middle, which was very, very fertile. And to monitor the drainage works, an additional acropolis was built on the quote-unquote island of Gla. The acropolis that I'm showing you here on the slide and the aerial photograph as well as the plan. The question is, how did these powerful principalities play with other principalities, right? Also other Mycenaean polities, but also other parts of the Aegean and of course their neighbors beyond the Aegean. The Mycenaeans themselves would probably tell you that they had conquered everybody and their mother. And indeed, the emphasis on warfare and male prowess is very strong in the material culture. From the fact that weapons 
and even entire panoplies were found in the graves of prominent individuals, or from the fact that Mycenaeans depict warrior scenes on pottery, such as this one, which is called a warrior vase from Mycenae, or on wall paintings, such as these ones from the Palace of Nestor in Pylos. And of course, if the stories reported by Homer are accurate, let's not forget that it was the Mycenaean kings that attacked the powerful city of Troy and destroyed it. Therefore, the inescapable conclusion is that the Mycenaeans sought to emphasize their warlike disposition and prowess. And indeed, Mycenaean influence is attested in various parts of the Aegean and the Cyclades, the Dodecanese and Crete. But how much of that was owed to savvy diplomatic ties and trade connections instead of conquest and violence remains to be seen. But just to nuance the discussion here, I need to mention that Mycenaean pottery literally floods the entire Aegean in ways that are akin to economic domination of that sector rather than actual conquest. As we mentioned before in the lecture about the Minoans, one of the Mycenaean conquests is purported to be Crete. The proponents of this hypothesis base their hypothesis on two main sources of evidence, the so-called warrior graves on the one hand, that is burials filled with weapons which in themselves these uh, represent a departure from prior attitude of the Minoans of the emphasizing warrior culture altogether. And secondly, the use of Linear B for the documentation in the palaces of Crete. It is true that the palace of Knossos betrays Mycenaean influence, mainly in the style of the wall paintings and decorations. For instance, the throne room at Knossos probably assumed its current look and arrangement during late Helladic 3a. But because the Mycenaeans were so influenced from the Minoans in every way, sometimes it is harsh parsing out what is Mycenaean, what is Minoan, such as this composition here which we saw repeated in the throne room of the palace of Pylos. Which one came first, this one or the one at Pylos? My money is on this one. Before we leave the topic of the Mycenaean era on Crete, we would be remiss if we didn't refer to the so-called Agia Triada sarcophagus. Sarcophagus actually means flesh eater, seriously. A sarcophagus is a fancy coffin. This one from Hagia Triada is pretty unique in many ways, but above all, because it depicts a Mycenaean era funeral of that guy on the right, a rather important individual, mind you. The right side of the panel shows a procession of males bearing gifts and sacrifices offered to the deceased, whereas on the left, Women are offering agricultural commodities, but they offer to an altar flanked by double axes. On the other side of the sarcophagus, we witness the ritual sacrifice of an animal and other rituals in front of altars filled with Minoan symbols. Again, a veritable mixing of Minoan and Mycenaean flair and rituals. As far as their relationships with Mycenaeans, with other neighboring states in the ancient Mediterranean, here are a couple pieces of evidence to consider. And let me state here that whatever evidence I'm referring to is very limited and a super selective sample. There is much more evidence out there for those relationships. So the trade relationships of the Mycenaeans can be assessed by the discovery of Mycenaean stuff in other parts of the Mediterranean, references in archives um, of the various kingdoms of the East, and of course shipwrecks. We are fortunate to have explored to 
two shipwrecks, which offer archaeologists another major window into the truly multicultural world of the Eastern Mediterranean. There are various documentaries out there for those shipwrecks, and I highly recommend watching one if you have the time and the inclination. But let's go over the shipwreck of Ulumburun, which sank off the coast of Bodrum, Turkey, while it was heading probably to a destination somewhere in the Aegean. Here's the construction of the ship. In the hull of the ship, there were all sorts of commodities and luxury items. The ship was filled with pottery that was transported either for its own sake or, more frequently, as a container of various commodities like terebinth resin or almonds, pine nuts, figs, olives, grapes, safflower, black cumin, sumac, coriander, whole pomegranates, wheat and barley. Metals were also very present in the hall. And metals were transported in raw form, but also in the form of ingots. Other luxury raw materials were found in the shipwreck. Raw materials such as ostrich eggs, elephant tusks, ebony and cedar logs, hippo incisors, Murex shells, which by the way produce the purple dye, and glass ingots, as well as agate and faience, shell, amber, chalcedony, Mycenaean blue glass. All of these commodities, all of these raw materials, were transported in their raw form so that they would be transformed into finished products at the destination. There were also finished luxury products, such as jewelry from Canaan, Egypt, and beyond. Various weapons of different types from Canaan, Mycenae, Bulgaria slash Romania, Northern Balkans, and the Near East. My favorite one is this bronze trident that you can find on the top right hand side of the slide. Another personal favorite of mine is this wooden diptych, which would hold wax in the two depressions, right, for taking notes. Finally, last but not least, the shipwreck produced various seals weights and measures, some of them from as far afield as Egypt, Assyria, and North Syria. All in all, the Olumburun shipwreck shows us that the Eastern Mediterranean was a highly interconnected world, at least as far as its elites were concerned. This interconnected world suffers a widespread disruption at the end of late Helladic 3 BE or 1200 BCE. The archaeological record in many parts of the Mediterranean shows that all of the kingdoms face challenges that destabilize them. So, for instance, in Egypt, Ramses III reports on the walls of Medinet Habu invasions of the so-called Sea Peoples. Similarly, the Hittite state crumbles under pressure of migration movements. And then there is a letter from the king of the king of Ugarit, which presents a plea for help against an attack from the sea. All in all, the Bronze Age was a pretty turbulent period that we're going to look at closely with our reflection this week. And of course, the Mycenaeans did not escape this turbulence. Perhaps the signs of turbulent times ahead were on the horizon 50 
years before the actual collapse of the Mycenaean palaces. As we have mentioned already, late in the late Helladic III B period, the citadels of Mycenae and Tyrins were retrofitted to include water sources and provide water in times of siege. The Pilos documents also preserve a curious mention. This mention can be interpreted that there was a danger coming from the east, from the sea, in the spring of the year that the Pilos palace was destroyed. And Pilos was not alone. Almost all Mycenaean palaces were affected by destructions, and worst of all, after the destructions, reconstruction never happened. Instead, with the dismantling of the palatial system, the whole system seems to break down, and after a short period of time when things went on without the tip of the social pyramid, Greece sinks into the, a dark age of sorts. But this is as far as I will go on with that. If you want more details, join me after the exam to see what happens next. Till then, thank you very much for your attention, and don't forget the reflection exercise at the uh, on the end of the Bronze Age this week, and of course the quiz on the entire Bronze Age. Good luck!